indigenous artifact repatriation and land ownership in indigenous communities. So first up, we're gonna watch a short video about Mercedes Doremi that the Hammer Museum created for our Made in LA biennial exhibition. And then Mercedes will speak for a couple of minutes and then she'll be joined on stage by the director of UCLA's Native Nations Law and Policy Center, Angela Riley, and the Fowler Museum archeology span curator, Wendy Teeter. So a quick bio of Mercedes. Mercedes was born here in Los Angeles and received her undergraduate at UCLA and the Master of Fine Arts from the San Francisco Art Institute. She calls on her Tongva ancestry to engage the problematics of visibility and the ideas of cultural construction. Her artwork is in the permanent collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the De Sassé Museum in Santa Clara, and the Phoebe Hearst Museum in Berkeley, and is exhibited internationally, and her writing and photographs have been featured in publications such as News from Native California and 580 Split. And right now, as I mentioned, you can see her work in the Hammers Made in LA 2018 Biennial. She's the recipient of grants and fellowships from the Mont Blanc Art Commission, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and FOCO, La Galleria de la Raza, the Harpo Foundation, and the Loop Artist Residency. And Mercedes has also worked for many years as a cultural resource consultant. So now let's watch the video and then welcome Mercedes Doremi to the podium. I think I was in a, the library at UCLA, and it was an old book, but I actually read all the Gavrilato died from disease and encroachment on their land. Wow, like what complete erasure when you like read that your own people are said to be gone. So my name is Mercedes, and this is uh, where I kind of call my outdoor studio. This area I work in is where the Gavrilano Tongva Indians would have lived. So that's my ancestry on my father's side is the Tongva. But then this house and this land was purchased by my mother's family, who's English, French, Caucasian, whatever you want to say. I have access to it for a very different reason. So I negotiate between looking at it with this history of the Tongva and then I also understand it as this home of my grandparents. When I started doing the cultural resource monitoring, you're called to these sites because you're ancestrally connected. And so I came out here and I was like, it, it, it's an interesting exploration in the same way. And I kind of started treating it as its own kind of site. Some of that ceremony kind of became part of me and, and my work out here was kind of redoing some of that. There's always this question for me of how much do I explain? How much do I unravel? How much do I decode? And a lot of our culture has these gaps because of what happened in California and the history and the kind of decimation and our tribe doesn't have a reservation. There's no place to have ceremony. There's no place to rebury our ancestors. There's no real central gathering space to come together. And so there are gaps, things that you can't ever know. Being okay with like filling in those gaps with other things and changing maybe the ceremony a little bit or the material that you're using, for me, that's what keeps it alive. At one point, like when we were doing a site with a lot of burials and a lot of the ancestors going back into the ground, I was looking at it as like, I was like a professional mourner, you know? like you were there to mourn these people because no one else was going to do it. A lot of this work is about trying to kind of take something that has a really difficult past. Opening that up can allow for like movement forward to keep it alive. There's a simple like, you know, we're still here. Thank you all for coming. So that picture of me at the end holding my eye like this, my dad said that if I posed like that with my hand on my hip and held the camera, that the camera would work. But it was actually just for him to take a photo of me holding the camera. So it's like the first photo. 
Um, yeah, thank you for being here. I'm going to give just a little bit of a background of my work and how it kind of led into the work at the Hammer and, and talk a little bit about that and try not to repeat too much of the video of our next conversation. So my first exploration um, really was looking at my family here in Los Angeles and the photos that I'd inherited of, of them. And because of the generational, um, like my da my dad was the youngest of nine kids, so there was my grandparents were the same age as my great grandparents on my other side. So some of these photos, I I almost didn't recognize my own family. Like I didn't, I don't remember them looking like this. And so it was a really sad feeling of, of being disconnected. And so what I did is I infused them literally back into my life um, in this way and use projectors in my apartment where I was living at the time to re-kind of create memories and re-envision um, re these people. I mean, there's this picture of my grandmother in the Colorado River and it's just magical to me. And, and to kind of get to know her like that, not as, you know, my grandma who had white hair and, you know, lived in West LA and, you know, fed us. <laughs> so it was really a way for me to kind of start this exploration back and um, look at the home that they grew up in, the home they lived in in Los Angeles. And, you know, my aunt told me the story that when they went to purchase that house, the neighbors actually sent around a petition to try to stop them from living there because they didn't want them in the neighborhood. And that was always a really telling moment for me because it, to me, says why they were really quiet about um, their past and about the, the ancestry, and they really didn't open up about it until much later in life. Um, and then the work that really um, this propelled me into was looking at the work I do as a cultural resource um, monitor, consultant. I don't photograph a lot, but this site was really important to me because of the magnitude of it. And really, instead of this taking, like, taking photos of this documenting of the process, to me it was documenting this reburial process, because we were coming in after everything had been removed from the ground, and we were tasked with doing a ceremony and, and reburying these people. And it was a very, very heavy burden, and it made a huge impact on me. I work with my father, who's on the right, um, wait, yes, on the right. And he's taught me a lot, and, and I kind of got at this in the video, but he's always really instilled in me that our job there is to keep the humanity of the people. You know, everybody comes at it from a different angle of, of how they're looking at the artifacts and the remains, and everybody kind of has a job, but our job as um, consultants is to remind everyone of that these were somebody's grandparents or aunt or child. There were infant burials on this site that just kind of killed me to think about. But um, to keep that humanity, and I remember being, like, you can see the magnitude, like this was trying to process, like this was kind of a scientific attempt to grid and, and level and deal with just um, how many people were kind of removed and looking at the actual artifacts from these these burials and this one is important to me because I always I remember or you sometimes hear that maybe the Tongva weren't the most artistic people or the most um, skillful and this was a steatite bowl with a beautifully beautiful wall and design on it and the craftsmanship to create something I couldn't you know I, I can't even imagine doing this so Working on these sites as difficult as it can be is also really enlightening and I have this experience with the things of our people and I get to interact with them and so um, it, it really, like I said, it made a big impact on me, the spaces that we work in and I started looking at the items that we were working, our own personal items. This is my grandmother's matate, this is actually in the show in the installation upstairs. Um, and looking at these ceremonies that we were were perform performing is maybe the wrong word, but doing for these people and the the remnants, this red yarn, all the stage was wrapped in red yarn, and looking at how the leftovers that were indicative of how many people we were were dealing with, um, and this image to me was always important because it's a Tongva prayer with an English translation and then my dad's handwritten notes about how to pronounce a word. And it was just this kind of beautiful layering of meaning and, and, 
and information. And I was looking at this at one point and I was like, oh no, it's the vanishing race. It's, it's being erased and the water is making it illegible. And you worry about portraying natives as not being present. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized these prayers and songs became a part of me. So I didn't need the paper anymore. So it was really, instead of being this sad thing, it was a moment of empowerment, um, looking at that, which propelled me into really looking at ceremony and my own interpretations and my own experiences with and spaces that were meaningful to me. And that's what propelled me out into the landscape and into areas in Los Angeles that have a personal connection and a familial connection and a cultural connection. And I mentioned the videos that, you know, these are my grandparents who lived in Malibu. They bought in the 50s. He was a school teacher. She was a stay-at-home mom with four kids. And somehow they managed to own a piece of property in Malibu. Um, so I grew up playing on this hillside. My aunts and uncles grew up playing on this hillside. My cousins grew up playing on this hillside. And so I took it for granted in a certain sense. But then I really started to look at it in a different way. And exploring it in a different way and seeing it as having access to this beautiful piece of the city for a reason that's very kind of personal and, and, and it's still private property and exploring it and, and recreating and performing and having this space to have ceremony. Um, I also looked at other sites in the Los Angeles area that were important to my family. This is a watering spring that my grandfather used to take my father to, and it has this beautiful grinding stone in one of the boulders that's huge. So it hasn't been taken and put in some, you know, taken away. Um, so it has this family story, but it's also a, a grinding stone that people who came way before us made that still is there. But again, it's on private property and I have access to it because my dad knows the owner because he knows everybody. Um, but so that's, he took me there. So really looking at the land, um, looking at these spaces as having a connection to the past, but also trying to have these moments of healing and reconciliation um, for this area that really saw a lot of um, a lot of destruction and a lot of um, sad moments that you have to grapple with. This is this is actually the grinding stone in that boulder, you know. And so, it's really important to me to look at these spaces anew and to kind of reclaim them in a way. And as much as I don't, I mean, have permanent access to these places, taking these photographs is a way for me to kind of hold a piece of this forever and talk about um, the tribal issues of, of how we grapple with not having resources or, or land to have ceremony, land to rebury our dead. You know, we have to kind of maneuver in a lot of ways to have space um, to perform our ceremony and to, to, have, to continue the culture. And there's a lot of good movement and a lot of good traction that's kind of happening in the city and that's very encouraging. But um, yeah, these are just ways that I can kind of look at um, at these spaces in a, in a different way. And this is that hillside. That's, that's what it looks like looking out. You can, it's a strange place that somehow has never been developed on the other side. Um, and so you kind of can imagine what it might have been like a long, long time ago. Um, and then, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the the um, the work I have in the Hammer here, in, in the Made in L.A. show. And for the first time, we kind of talked about interspersing the, some of the work that I've done on um, these mon this monitoring site. I've actually never shown these images. They're not on my website. I'm very protective about how they've been put out into the world and there was a lot of conversation about are they their own body of work do they need to be separate from the ceremonial interventions and where we landed was really inter interspersing them within um, the bodies of work and I think that I'm really happy with that because one really infused the other and you kind of I wouldn't be making these 
pieces without having those experiences on the the monitoring sites, on on the anthropological sites. It really um, gave me a lot to work through, a lot to think about, a lot to explore, and they really um, infuse each other. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, I'm going to do this view. The installation that I worked with, and this was um, kind of new for me, and I really wanted to work with these objects, and there are these artifacts that are found in this area. I believe one has been found in Chile, but really they're in, only found in this part of the world, and they're specific to our tribe, and nobody knows what they were used for. Their meaning has been lost in a certain sense. So you get interpretations. And it's actually been really fun to do this work because everybody I talk to has a different idea or a different um, dream about what they were for. And some of it's very practical, you know, and people want them to be functional, very functional objects. And, you know, I kind of go the other way. And, and because of the context of the site where I was working, where they found so many of these, you know, I really feel like they are these items that were of the stars and mapping and you know the Tongva had a calendar and they understood the night sky and so for me I wanted to create a sense of the stars in the night sky and I wanted it to, to be Orion because growing up in Los Angeles that's pretty much the only constellation you can see in the night sky you know it's like those three big stars and that's about it so that's the one I can recognize and I've gone other places in the world I'm like that's Orion you know but so it was important to me and, and I really loved how it rises due east and sets due west like it's a marker like the north star would be of directions and you know there's a lot of symbolism for me and what kind of is burst and what can be put to rest. And so for me, I really wanted it to kind of put to rest some of the difficult feelings around that I had around this particular site um, and, and kind of make something positive from it and honor um, those people. And so I cast these out of concrete. I was gonna use the actual artifacts and I was like, oh, I don't think they'll let me put like pigment and paint the actual things. So I was like, I'll just make them. And so. I cast them in concrete as um, as a kind of a, another marker of Los Angeles and giving light to what is just below the surface. We exist on this kind of concrete crest and there's so much just below it, not even that deep sometimes. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of background on this. So I think that is all. I think that... Claudia's gonna come up and do, yeah. Um, we'll get back up here. But yeah, there you go. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our other two panelists. Professor Angela Riley is an internationally renowned indigenous rights scholar. She's professor of law at UCLA School of Law and the director of UCLA's Native Nations Law and Policy Center. She directs the joint degree program in law and American Indian studies and is the UCLA campus representative on issues related to repatriation under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. Her research focuses on indigenous people's rights, with a particular emphasis on cultural property and native governance. Her work is published in the Yale Law Journal, Columbia Law Review, California Law Review, Georgetown Law Journal, and numerous others. She received her undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma and her law degree from Harvard Law School. Professor Riley began her career clerking for Chief Judge T. Kern of the Northern District of Oklahoma. She then worked as a litigator at Quinn Emanuel in LA, specializing in intellectual property litigation. And then in 2003, she was elected to serve on her tribe's Supreme Court, becoming the first woman and youngest justice of the Supreme Court of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma. She was then elected by her tribe's general counsel to serve as Chief Justice. She's the co-chair of the United Nations Indigenous Peoples Partnership Policy Board, which is a commitment to the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. She's also an evidentiary hearing officer for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians. Professor Riley is a member of the American Law Institute and a co-editor of the Cohen's Handbook on Federal Indian Law. She has also served as the United Na Indian Nation Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. 
Wendy Giddens Teeter is the Curator of Archaeology for the UCLA Fowler Museum. Since 1998, her work is focused on cultural heritage issues of North and Central America, and she has over 20 years of professional archaeological experience in Belize and Southern California. Dr. Teeter teaches through UCLA's American Indian Studies Department and is also a part-time faculty member in anthropology at Cal State Northridge. Since 2007, she's been the co-director of the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project with the Tongva community, where they not only do research, but also use the opportunity to teach field methods and processes from an indigenous perspective. She is a founder of the Tribal Learning Community and Educational Exchange Program in the UCLA School of Law's Native Nations Law, Law and Policy Center. Dr. Teeter has been the coordinator of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, which I think will probably come up again during this evening. Um, she's been coordinating that at UCLA since 1998 and has worked with the team at the Native Nations Law and Policy Center to repatriate 90% of UCLA's holdings of Native American burials. Among many shows she curated at the Fowler Museum, Dr. Teeter co-curated the exhibition Launching a Dream, Reviving Tongva Maritime Traditions with Cindy Alvitri. Teeter also serves on many boards and committees around issues of curation, NAGPRA, and cultural resource protection, and she received her PhD in anthropology from UCLA. So now, please join me in welcoming Angela Riley, Wendy Teeter, and Mercedes Doremi. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, well, I think we're, we're tasked with just sort of having an informal conversation tonight. We're going to kind of talk about um, Mercedes' work and then how it ties to some of the work that Wendy Teeter and I do um, in also overlapping spheres of cultural property and cultural heritage and museum work and, um, and the law and the history. So um, should I start? Can I start yeah. by asking you a question? So one of the things that... Um, we thought might be interesting to talk about tonight kind of as a starting place would be to discuss a little bit of Mercedes' work. She talked in the video about the work of monitoring and cultural monitoring and what that is and what that means for Native people um, and exactly what the mechanics of it are. So I thought maybe if you don't mind, you could start by talking a little bit about that and explaining what that work is. Sure. Um, so when items are found that are culturally significant to our tribe, in our tribal area, um, depending on if it's human remains or just artifacts, we're brought in as either cultural monitors, cultural consultants, you know, depending on what you want to say. And we're there to give recommendations. And so it's an interesting position to be put in because you're there specifically because of your ancestry. So I don't have a degree in anthropology. I don't have the scientific background, but you're there kind of as a consultant on the cultural significance of things. And so I've learned a lot on these sites. Um, and sometimes you're faced, like these cogged stones, you're faced with items that you don't know the context to. So it's a really odd place to be in as a person because you don't always have these answers that you feel like you should have, you know? And, and at the same time, it's hard because there's, it means that there's development happening in a place that maybe you don't want it to be happening. And so you're, you're in one sense, enabling it because you're there as this person, as this point person, but you're also, like, feel that weight and that responsibility of it's important what you're doing and to be ethical and to be sensitive and, like I said, keep the humanity of things. And so you feel like you need to be there. Um, it, it's just a, it's a, it's an interesting kind of place to be put um, as a, to navigate. Um, and maybe you can speak to the other side of, you know, <laughs> how you work with us and how that happens. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of talked a little bit about what makes, um, what, sort of instigates or what starts the process by which you would ask a tribal member to come out to a land. And there's sort of a twofold. So there's, there's state law and there's federal law. 
And um, I think we were going to ask um, Angela, if you wouldn't mind speaking more to the theoretical, and then I could go in, segue into some of the more practical. So why is it that, that really um, Mercedes and members of these different nations have to go out on these sites while development's happening? Well, maybe I'll start a little bit with the historical and mm -hmm. the, the legal. Um, this is something, being from Oklahoma, that you just, you kind of grow up knowing, but people in California, I think, are not aware of it in the same way because the history is so different here. But, you know, Oklahoma was Indian territory, and Oklahoma is when, you know, when the federal government decided to remove the tribes from the upper Midwest and from, um, in some cases, the upper Northeast, but mostly the Southeast, um, move them to a new place. They moved them to Indian Territory, which was unoccupied at the time and became the state of Oklahoma. So if you've heard of the Trail of Tears or the Trail of Death or numerous other forced marches, those are the marches that moved the indigenous population to what is now Oklahoma. There are only a couple of tribes there that um, were actually indigenous to that region. So for us, the concept of removal, and my own tribe is Potawatomi, and we have a reservation. We had a reservation in Oklahoma, which was opened up to allotment. But um, for most tribes in Oklahoma and most Native people from Oklahoma, the concept of removal is just part of who you are. You're born understanding that, and people in Oklahoma understand that. In California, people are less familiar with that history, and it was um, a very, very brutal barbaric history in California because by the time the um, the time came to really settle a lot of this state, it was so rich in natural and cultural resources, um, including gold, of course, among other things, um, that the native population was considered entirely dispensable um, the, to the extent that people were not moved off or even killed and there were bounties put on native people in California. Um, they were put into the mission system where many people were enslaved. Um, and so moved off of those rich, beautiful coastal lands that so many Native people occupied since time immemorial. And so the result of that history is that in a place like California, much of the resource-rich lands ended up outside of Native hands, which is what happened in most of um, the United States. But it's even a more stark history here, I think, in California. Um, and then because of the process of the way the federal government goes about recognizing whether a tribe is a tribe under federal law or not. Um, many of the tribes in California, including many in our own region here, um, aren't recognized as recognized tribes. So they don't have um, set aside land bases by the federal government and they don't have federal recognition or reservations in the traditional sense. So a lot of these sacred places then um, and places where ancestors are buried in other places are not on, they're not Indian land anymore. They are on land held by non-Indians. And therefore, there's a lot of development um, and private um, expansion that takes place on those lands. And that's what sort of gets us to this point. Right, and then in the 19... 70s, but even earlier than that, there's a recognition that we need to provide an opportunity for tribes to be able to have some sort of say and um, and take responsibility for their their debt for their their ancestors, and so you have this sort of very codified um, under the California Environmental Quality Act and under the National Environmental Protection Act, where there's okay archaeology can happen. But if you find ancestors, really often ancestors only, then the Native American Heritage Commission um, is allowed to designate a most likely descendant. And they're allowed to give recommendations as to what happens to those dead, to these people's ancestors. It's a recommendation, so actually the landowner doesn't have to even comply. All they have to do is we bury it someplace on the land where it won't be disturbed. So when you're out there, um, and I've worked a lot with Mercedes dad, so it's kind of fun. Um, but when you're out there, it means that they can take you or not take you. They can allow you on the land or not allow you on the land. And you may or may not be heard when you're trying to advocate for your ancestors. So I mean, it, just imagine that sort of situation that people are put in um, across California and across the US, and that sort of created that disparity, not even talking about what's in museums, but that's often the day-to-day, -day. And, and I have to say, this is a day-to-day -day, um, event, so my job as a museum curator, 
the Fowler Museum, because of the archaeologists at UCLA, has the largest collection of history for Los Angeles. And that means all the way from 13,000 years ago all the way um, to the present, and or 60 years ago, and that keeps going. And we'll, we won't talk about who's 60 here and now qualifies for being a, uh, um, a historical property. <laughs> But so it does mean that, that we have these, these amazing cultural artifacts and remnants of historical events. And it only has been since NAGPRA, and it really we're talking about 1998, yeah. um, that there has been access without having to deal with a federal mandate for tribal um, representatives to come in to the museum. Can I just uh, pop in for a second mm -hmm. and just say maybe, Mercedes, if you're comfortable saying why one of the things I, I do a lot of work in this area and cultural property in terms of the legal side of it, and one of the challenges is explaining to people why this matters so much. Mm -hmm. Why do Native people care so much about um, the unearthing of ancestors, disturbing the graves of human remains, um, even cultural properties, whether they're intellectual properties from images and ideas, um, and dances and designs all the way to the more concrete um, artifacts like some of what you use in your work. So maybe if you could explain a little bit why you think these things are important to you as a Native person and why you think they're important to Native people generally. Right. I mean, in essence, I think they're important to all people, but I think that historically Native sometimes bodies and artifacts have really been seen as possessions or like keepsakes or, you know, like there was all the uh, stuff that got collected from Los Angeles before any of these protections came into effect. And it's kind of like, for some reason, Native people are looked at differently. I, I try to, I actually had a conversation with my grandmother, my the one who owned the house in Malibu, and I was talking about working on these sites, and she said, why do you care? They're just bones anyways. And, you know, of a different generation, and she's my grandmother, she's passed away now, and, and I, it was one of those moments where I was, I was just speechless because she had just purchased a headstone for her infant daughter who passed away in the hospital, like 60 plus years ago. So I'm like, it's that same reason, that's why they matter. The same reason you would put a headstone on your family member is the same reason why these things are very important to us. And, you know, I worked on this one site and, and we had family connection to this particular place. So every time a bag that said cranium dust or, you know, these bundles of people would come in, I, it could have been an immediate relative. And so to kind of have to face that and, and, and maybe it would be easier for me if I just could disconnect, but I think that my job is to remain connected and to continue to feel and to feel the importance and to understand that, you know, we didn't want those people to be, um, you know, sometimes there's very isolated kind of people that are encountered and you really understand. Um, this one particular site was a lot of people, probably close to or more than a thousand. It was a cemetery. It was a cemetery that went back thousands of years up till mission contact. It was a lot of people over a lot of time. And it's a really lonely place because you do feel like this probably wouldn't happen in the same way, in the same quiet way that nobody really knows what's going on if it wasn't Native people, if it wasn't Native bodies that were being kind of... And so I know other people deal with similar issues, but... I, it sometimes it's a it's a kind of deep feeling lonely place that, and like I said, that's what I work with when I make art. You know, trying to process those feelings and that those experiences. And sometimes it's a really good experience. And you're working with people that really listen to you and they learn and they they want to embrace your recommendations. And sometimes it's not that. And when it's not that, it's you always feel like you're not doing enough and you don't have the power to do more. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky place to be in. Um. 
But that, that actually made me think of a lot of the issues too of, you know, how, what did it mean to sort of grow up in this sort of, this very urban landscape where everyone, everyone almost, is from someplace else and being the 1% of the 1% of, of Native people um, that are actually, this is your land, this is your traditional territory from time immemorial. How, how do you feel about growing up in that environment? Um, and then how does it relate to your work? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I took it for granted to a certain extent. You know, you're a kid, like I said, I grew up playing on these hillsides and I didn't really see it. I mm -hmm. took it for granted. Then I went to UCLA, I stayed really close to home for <laughs> undergrad and, you know, I didn't, it took me actually leaving Los Angeles and living away from it for a bit to really feel how connected I am to this place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like to, to walk away and then come back and like smell the hills in the summertime. You're like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, and like, like when I see, like we were at the beach the other day and there was just like a huge like pack of dolphins. I don't know what you say, a group of dolphins <laughs> in the, like just, 30 maybe just playing like these these moments that I have and like I was you know preparing for this big opening and super nervous and I was sitting in my like the backyard of this house like looking in the like the moon came up and it made that path on the water and it just feels like okay everything like this makes sense again you know it I didn't realize how connected and how how much this place is home and and is important to me until I, I came up away from it but and that is what you know I go to these places that have importance to me either from a family story or from my father or just places that I've experienced that that I I, I want to um, show to people like, like that grinding stone like that's just hanging out over there right. it's there like this, this the presence of the Tongva exists it's just kind of hidden a little bit so part of my work is to really be like hey look at like here, even though I don't get into specifics about where these are, just the fact that to see the land as as maybe we don't see it, you know, LA is Hollywood, LA is all these other things, and so to maybe look at the the, the place in, in just in a different way. Yeah, I remember um, walking around a lot of places with like Cindy and mm -hmm. and and your dad and and many other people from the West Side, and sort of talking about how you kind of as Tongva, remove the veneer. Like it's not just a matter of seeing the, this urbanness, but you recognize every hill and oh, well we're now on Hill Street and there was actually this happening and, and Angie's talked about this and, and you know, your aunt and your dad have talked about, well, this is where we played and this is where the dairy was and this is where that was and there was a stream here. And looking at Lincoln Boulevard, not as Lincoln Boulevard, but as a stream and looking at just really recognizing that landscape and it helped me recognize like now I don't see LA quite the same way yeah. and especially places like Caravagna the at uni high these places that are still in existence with yeah. the springs and and you feel what it was like yeah um, well one other question that I thought would be interesting to talk about it because we're kind of connecting the museum world with the native world and, and cultural property and cultural heritage. Um, Wendy and I have actually worked together a lot. Um, we do repatriation work together at UCLA. Um, she's the one who knows what she's doing and I'm just the lawyer who fights for the cause. <laughs> um, so I just defer to her on all, all things basically um, to do with archeology span and NAGPRA. But, um, but one of the big challenges I think is thinking about, you know, we work on a committee together at UCLA. We have an, a, a wonderful committee there, and, and there are some people in this room who are on that committee. Um, but we also then, um, I'm the representative from UCLA who works with um, a university, a, a UC-wide committee um, that's convened out of the office of the president that is um, across all of the UC campuses, and every campus kind of has its own culture and its own um, approach to how they deal with repatriation issues. And so you see a really wide swath on what museums can be, um, how, what some do very successfully. Um, and I wanted Wendy to talk a little bit about how you function as a person who is really trying to see the nuances and the tapestry in cultural property and cultural heritage of Native people in a museum context which isn't always um, incredibly friendly 
to those viewpoints and, and how you, because she does a brilliant job of, of bridging these worlds. I mean, a brilliant job. You have no, we can't even talk about some of the amazing things she's done, but trust me, they're amazing. Um, and how you bring people together and how you create that dialogue, I think is really important to talk about. Um, well, you know, my, I, I feel very fortunate in some ways to not having been taught California archeology span when I was at UCLA, I worked in Belize. And uh, I remember being a graduate student and um, I have a background in osteology. So I was actually brought in to identify human remains from animal remains at UCLA. And that as a graduate student kept me employed for five years. So <laughs> I was okay doing this, but while I was involved, NAGPRA was just beginning at UCLA and there was some very contentious issues going on. And, um, and I felt really, relieved to be working in Belize because I remember going to some of these big like panel discussions in the law school and having sort of Clem Meehan on one side who is an archaeologist who was very anti-NAGPRA and having like Carol Goldberg or Laura Miranda or some of the graduate students at American Indian Studies on the other side and there just being this very sort of almost fight for your life like for Clem Meehan it was this was his legacy this was being able to talk about the history of the Tongva of, of native people was his entire career and kind of who he felt he was viscerally. So to have the native people say, no, 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 we're good. We'll, we'll talk about ourselves, it's okay. Um, hurt him, I think, in a way that he couldn't grapple with. And that disjuncture, I kept thinking like, wow, this really is a hard conversation. And I'm really glad I work in Belize and don't have to deal with these issues. <laughs> and then immediately got the job being curator of archeology span and had to deal with these issues. So I always tell my students like, just because you think that you know your path, doesn't mean that that is the path that you will be on. But it does mean that I didn't really have a stake in the game. And so I look to the Tongva community, to the Shumash community, who were already working with our ethnographer, Diana Wilson, who um, is from the Museum of Jurassic Technology, but she was a cultural anthropologist. And so she's the one who introduced me to the community and already had been working with the Tongva and the Shumash, the Wanenyo, um, Ahashiman people, and the Tatavium. And so it gave me an entree. And I really naively said, okay, so this is my job now. Um, okay, who, who do we have the most people from that we need to return? And she was like, oh, the Shumash. And I said, okay, so that's uh, San Inez is the only federally recognized tribe. We'll just make a meeting and we'll go in there and, and talk to them and we'll return these things. And she said, okay. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like I was being set up. But I sort of gathered all of my data together and we went to the elders council meeting and there were you know, probably eight native elders, Shumash elders there. And I said, I'm from UCLA. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we know who you are. And I went, oh, okay. And I listened for an hour while the complete history of how people like Clem Meehan had said to one of the elders that it would be over his dead body that they would ever set foot inside the Fowler Museum or within the archeological collections into his ancestral um, property. And so that's where I started from. But it gave me an opportunity to learn without having any kind of bias. And I have to say that if you come at any of this from the place of, of wanting to connect and may build those relationships, then I'm not there to be UCLA, but I represent UCLA, so, but I am there to learn the history and then to how can we improve that history. And I think that that's what's worked really well. And we learned NACPRA together. We learned CEQA together. We learned all of what needed to be done um, as a group of people just wanting to do right. And, and I've been embraced by the, um, the Tongva and the local communities and, and feel that connection back. But it, it's not a bias, it's just a, a place of learning. How does it feel <laughs> on the other side of that? Um. Well, it's, it's interesting because often people ask me, like, well, where are those artifacts? Mm -hmm. You know, like, because I, I talk about recreating and making my own interpretation of them, and they'll say, well, where are they? And off that particular site, I don't know. I don't know what happened because of things that happened. And 
Um, but then on the other side of that, I know that a lot of our items are with the Fowler, and there is this kind of, I'd much rather that be, I, it's very important to have people who are willing to kind of be, we were talking about this being culture bearers, like mm -hmm. holding on to these things because, I mean, we don't have a reservation, we don't have a cultural center, we don't have a, a independent museum. So you are, ha you have to make these connections and, and build these bridges and, and have these relationships so that, you know, you have access to, to your, these items and, um, you know, it's really important that when institutions step up and, and house them and, and care for them and, and hold them for us, because um, I'd much rather that happen than them sit in a, somebody's garage somewhere, you know, <laughs> which are like the lore of like where these other things ended up. And that, that to me is, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's lost for like my daughter, you know, like. I can't show her those things if they go into some private place that no one ever has access to. Um, yeah. So, um, how do you? One of the things that that brings up for me is sort of from a cultural property perspective, kind of navigating that line between respecting the sacred and then um, building off of what you know or what you don't maybe don't know in some with some of the things that you're referencing um, to create art which requires you to be inventive, to be creative, to push boundaries a little bit, maybe in some cases to even reinterpret things in a way that they weren't interpreted a thousand years ago, um, maybe to put your own spin onto things in ways that can be seen as pushing the envelope too much, sometimes both within and without Native communities. Mm -hmm. So I think being a Native artist is like, in and of itself, a really challenging place to be in the world. Um, luckily, I have no artistic talent, so this is <laughs> never a problem for me. But, um, but I wonder how you think about that and whether, and whether that's a complicated relationship with your own community. Yeah, I mean, it definitely can be. I started doing this really as a reaction to my own experience. I started talking about the culture and the ancestry and the problematics of it because of really trying to work through my own experiences. So I always feel like it comes from a very personal place. And I look at my own family's stories, you know, the, the, the way that they've approached or how my grandparents were. And I, 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 I so I can't say that I, it's hard because you're looked at as speaking for a bigger group. Um, and it is, you know, I'm making it, and I, I, that's why I'm very intentional about saying it's my personal interpretation um, or saying that these ceremonies are what, it's experience. It's listening to wax records from the Smithsonian that have our songs on them that I've learned and, and have friends who have translated so that I know what I'm singing. You know, there's a, there's a lot of piecing back together and I, I like to be very um, forthright about that because I don't think anyone of our group can say definitively there's this point A to point B where I am standing right now that doesn't have gaps in it. You know, like we have to acknowledge that we're all working to create a vibrancy and a living culture. And part of that is allowing for some breathing room. And that's sometimes not well received. And I understand that. And in a lot of ways, I have become more empowered about saying that, more empowered about talking about ceremony. I used to be very quiet about it. I mean, it's absolutely what I was doing, but I wouldn't talk about it because I didn't yet feel the authority to say that that's what I was doing, you know? And, and so it's been a journey for, you know, me too. And, and being an artist, you're always trying to kind of shine light in places, you know, or, or illuminate like moments or experiences or ways of seeing the world that you hope that people can um, join in with you. Um, I just, my, one of my grad school pro uh, professors came to the show. I hadn't seen him since grad school. And it was a beautiful moment. I said, you know what, Reagan? I told somebody just recently how you always told us we were the canaries in the coal mine, mm -hmm. you know? And I still think about that, you know? That's our job, to kind of be that 
boys. Where would you like to sort of see, where do you see the future of the Tongva? What would you like to see? And how might that relate to your art? I mean, I think that having any piece of permanent land where we could create something. I mean, like there's Tongva Park now, yeah. which is nice, but it's not ours. No. You know, it's, it's beautiful, you know, yeah. there are these beautiful <laughs> places. There's like, like we were talking about Long, Cal State Long Beach has Pavangna. Pavangna. It, the Long Beach Aquarium has this festival once a year. Like there are places that open up to us, but for me, really having some space that the group could unite and, and have um, a permanent presence in a place where we are and were and have been and, and having that visibility, I think that would be really beautiful. Um, yeah, I think that would be the really the best thing for the, the group, <laughs> but that's, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard thing and maybe, you know, it goes into the whole federal versus state recognition and we're not legally obligated to have anything because of the way that history went down. Yeah. So. Um, do, should we open it up for questions? Is this a good time to do that? I have no idea what time it is. It's like 8.30, so that. Okay, yeah, should we do that? Yeah. Okay, um, I think we're opening it up for questions, but I think there are people in the audience who are gonna come around with microphones, I think. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, they're coming. Hi, so I actually have two questions. So the first one is, I'm not familiar with the federal, state, tribe official list. So if you could just say a few words about that and if potentially you can be on that list at some point. The second one is what kind of sites are open to the public in LA or around LA that we could visit if we want to know more about your culture? Yeah. Um, well, I'll take the first one. The, the first question was to explain a little bit about the difference between state and federal recognition with tribes. Um, the federal government, I mean, the primary relationship between Indian nations and the, the United States is a federal tribal one in this country. And that goes all the way back to a history of treaty making, the formation of the Constitution with a particular status for Indian nations, and then a whole hundreds of years of body of federal law that designate the relationship between tribes and the federal government. And there were a couple of big reasons for this at the point of the inception of the country, which I'll just be really brief about, but one was because the federal government wanted a monopoly on acquiring Indian lands so that states couldn't become too powerful or foreign powers couldn't become too powerful within what was this new burgeoning nation. So that was one of the main reasons. Um, the other, the, the reason, so that was partially just to keeping the federal uh, supremacy essentially over the states and then the land monopoly. Um, so with that as the primary relationship, you'll hear people talk about how many federally recognized tribes there are in the United States. There are 567 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, more than half of those are um, Alaskan native villages in Alaska. So in the lower 48, it's um, in the low 300s. And so the federal government has had um, historically a process for determining whether a tribe is federally recognized or not. It has deep historical roots. The problem with many Indian communities, including the Tongva and others, is that the process happened very haphazardly at various points in history and very politically. And then even in California in the 1950s, there was a project called Termination, which the idea was to de-recognize a bunch of federally recognized tribes with the idea that eventually no tribes would exist anymore. And the federal government's obligation of trust to Indian nations would be dissipated. And that happened in the 1950s with over 100 tribes terminated. Um, that pilot project started in California um, and there were over 100 tribes terminated in California. Some of them have been reinstated, many of them have not. Um, and then the, the process of trying to gain termination, uh, gain recognition for those who had never been terminated but also never been formally recognized um, also kind of was on the ascension. And uh, about the same time that the process of land and 
scarcity of resources became really prevalent in California, making it really difficult to gain federal recognition in California and anywhere. So there are 567 now. There are no federally recognized tribes in LA County. Um, the politics of LA County make it in my view, somewhat unlikely that any tribe will receive federal recognition in LA County anytime in my lifetime. I hope that that's not the case, but, but that's the situation we're in now. So for example, just to give you a very, very brief example, when we talk about land, Indian land in the United States, like a reservation, for example, um, and I'll just use like my own tribes, we'll say treaty territory, because there aren't reservations in Oklahoma anymore, but our treaty territory in Oklahoma is, um, it's our land, it's Indian land. But what that really means is that it's held in trust for us by the federal government. The federal government literally holds the title to our land. We don't hold the title to our own land. We can't sell our land. Um, the federal government is the only party entity that can sell our land and we can't lease our land or significantly encumber our land without federal permission. So that land is held in trust for us. So when a tribe doesn't have federal recognition, they don't have the ability to have like a collective reservation land. Of course, individual Tongva people can go buy land and allow other people to come on it, but it's not the same for purposes of sovereignty, government, taxation, policing, courts, incarceration, all the things that we have on our own systems of government, you aren't empowered to do that. Um, and so you don't have a collective land base. And that's one of the biggest differences, really. You also can't engage in economic development. So that's one of the biggest differences between being federally recognized and not. Some states have processes for, re for recognizing tribes at the state level, and it can have benefits for those tribes depending on what the state structure is. But it's very state dependent, and you still never get the same degree of sovereignty and self-determination that you have as a federally recognized tribe. So it is a really politically, um, it's a historically, politically, um, legally very complex issue, but that's, that's sort of the status of state versus federal. But then I think the other question was where can they go physically to learn about Tongva history and visit <laughs> sites? And I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna defer to you all on that one. Well, that's part of the issue that I'm talking about, that there isn't, I'm, well, there, okay, there are places. Mm -hmm. Um, like we were talking that the Santa Monica History Museum just had a great show all about the Tongva and did a really good job, um, but it wasn't permanent. And they'll, they'll put some things in and they're permanent. Um, the National History Museum, I believe, just, just redid their whole mm -hmm. California, so I would say that. I feel like I always refer people to yeah, the first Angelinos that the book. Audrey did the, <laughs> the um, California Connections, First Californians? Is that the name of it? Yeah. First Californian. So there, there's been more of an attempt. Um, yeah. Mishana Goman, who's in the audience, and uh, Maylee Blackwell and myself have been working with the Tongva and Tataviam to do mapping indigenous LA. So www.mila.ss.ucla.edu. And you can go on there and you can see maps that were created and we've asked Mercedes to help us with one, um, that are basically primarily their maps. So how do they make place and see the land? And so there's one on water, there's, there's um, one with connections to, um, to sacred sites uh, that Craig Torres has done. So there are many other, there's a forefronting with Koravangna, which is our closest uh, sacred site, which is at Uni High, and Julie Bogany is, is um, the president of that association. So there's, there's many opportunities that we've basically found within sort of the virtual world since it's, it's not one, I guess this is important to say, there's not one Tongva people. Um, the idea of tribe is not something that occurred within California. It's about families and about villages. So even this idea of one right. people was, they kind of get dinged as, as if they're supposed to be one people, but they were never one people. They are a collection of villages that were intermarried, and that's what they are now. And uh, if you got into <laughs> a big fight, you went off and started your own village. So, um, so I hear this, I, I, we both hear this a lot of, and so does most everybody else who works in academia. Oh, I can't work with the Tongva. Oh my God, they fought at the time. And it's like, no, 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 no. They fight like family because they are family. And, and you can still work with them quite easily if you want to. 
Um, so, but you'll find that on Mila. So we've been trying to create ways where the Tongva voices are front and center. We did a big educational conference at the Kurabangna Springs, and that will all be online for K through 12 um, and, and academics to use as well. Thank you very much for this discussion. Oh, did I interrupt somebody? No. Um, I was wondering, um, Mercedes, if you could talk about the red strings that come down that are taught. Mm -hmm. they, they connect photographs. They're on, on um, organic material. They're on furniture. And I was just wondering if you could discuss how that came about and what the meaning of that might be. Sure. Um, there was one image I kind of mentioned that was almost a table with a lot of kind of remnants of red yarn all over it. And it was what all the sage we used on the site with the really large reburial was all wrapped in. And it was this material that was kind of left over and it was kind of just heavy because it it um, it pointed to the magnitude and like the, the really magnitude of the, of the burial site for me. Um, so I started looking as a material, as a like connective thing. One of the series I did was called sinews because, to me, it's about this like connective tissue. Uh, sinews are nonlinear; they're kind of messy, but they still connect things together. So I started really looking at it as a um, as a connective material. But then, in the installation here, it still has that meaning, but what I was doing is I, I really wanted to use it to create a space, that circular um, space for me references a yovar, which is a ceremonial space, and you would find the evidence of that by pole holes, you know, in the ground, and so each of those 12 points for me is a connection. It, it's to create that space kind of a, ephemerally, um, and they always had they had open top uh, ceilings, which is why that ring is up there, because it was a space where you moved between worlds. And I just like that idea of kind of transcending. And there, just to pick up, there was a question actually of what is at Uni High, and since some people don't know about the springs, could you all explain? Because we've mentioned it, <laughs> referred to it several times, but not everybody knows. Well, it's her family, but um, so the University High School has uh, Sacred Springs on there. They're called the Sarah Springs, which is horrible. Um, the the Tongva call them the Kuravangna. It, it was actually a village, and it was recorded um, in the Crespi. So it was a place that was visited during um, the villages were actually visited, and it was a stop during the. Um, during the, the first explorers. And so we know from that recording or from those documents and journals, what the name of it, of the village was, Kuravangna. And so that's been traditionally used for the springs. And you can go on the first Saturday, it's a public opening and you can go and visit. They love volunteers to help keep the springs clean and they, they have a long-term lease basically for the Tongva community from LA Unified because it's on the high school. So it's a great place for, especially Univers our Native students University here, to go. Yeah. Yes, University High School. <laughs> it is, what's uh, the address? Barrington? Yeah, it's on Barrington, and um, just, what would that be? Just north of Santa Monica um, Boulevard. So Barrington and Santa Monica go up like two blocks. The springs. Yeah, there, there is a, there is a building, um, and it's, a, I mean, it, it's a small cultural center, but the springs are there, so it's a natural outdoor pond springs, Pools and it's just water. actually a place to, to be, kind of in nature and be centered, which is not a whole lot of spaces <laughs> down in the flats. I mean, obviously you can go into Topanga Canyon. There are places in the hills you can go, but this is actually a really good representation of what West Los Angeles would be like. And it was once a dairy farm before that, or, you know, after the, there were no more Tongva being able to have access, but it was a dairy farm and then eventually became LA Unified.
Hi, thank you guys so much for speaking tonight. Um, I was wondering, forgive me if this has been answered before I stepped out, but um, if, like, what is the protocol exactly for, let's say, the Fowler, because I know you can't speak for every museum of, like, inherited from ancestor type artifacts that are donated but aren't really the families? That's kind of, yeah, I think that's it. Um, so the, can I repeat the question? So the question was, and it was for you, Wendy, was um, <laughs> for the others might not have heard either. What is the protocol for a museum like the Fowler when you come into possession of artifacts that are, and human remains? Mm -hmm. um, and and who, how do you deal with them and how do you know who to reach out to and all of those things? Well, since the um, California Environmental Quality Act and then we have um, human resource codes that basically keep ancestors in the ground now, so while they might be disturbed during development, they, they just have to be put back into place. So if you're a landowner and you come across human remains, you're not allowed to take them inside your house. I know there was a big thing in the 50s of people taking skulls and putting them on their mantle. That's not allowed. So you have to keep them in the ground, not in your house, and they need to be reburied. But if, you, if there's an inadvertent discovery, and this happens, this is where I guess my entree being an osteologist comes in, um, is that I will often be asked to see whether or not the remains are human. And a coroner um, is not necessarily a specialist in osteology. So um, the Tongva community might send me photos and say, hey, can you talk? Is this a, is this a, a native person from long ago? Because their determination first is, is this a homicide, right? So sometimes I'll get detectives that will call me and from the Native American monitor saying, is this someone who is old or is this a recent thing? And then if it isn't, then the coroner will make that determination that, okay, this is a Native person. And an archaeologist is often, if they have that background, will make that determination. And then the Native American Heritage Commission is immediately notified and they designate a most likely descendant meaning somebody who is known to be, have, be descended from a community, from a village nearby. So that's how... Yeah, that's my father. So yeah, one exactly. Of, one of those people on that list is my father. Exactly. So, so, that... so human remains now are left in the ground, and, and the most likely descendant will deal with them. So we, haven't, we don't accept human remains at the Fowler Museum. And, um, but in terms of cultural material, so... Um, some of the biggest developments like Playa Vista um, have destroyed um, lots and lots of villages that were left in the, um, in the ground. And so we became the repository for those that could not be, so there were lots of people put back in the ground with their items. The village material was then brought to the Fowler Museum. While we are open to the public, not everyone gets to come back to where the collections are. And Usually the community gets, you know, is often helps us decide who comes in and who doesn't because these are their materials. But we're open for research. So if you have a really good reason for wanting to be there, then there's sort of an evaluation. But I try to basically defer to the community, especially when it's dealing with questions about sacred objects or burial material. We discourage it. We don't allow destructive analysis if it's still there. Um, but almost everything has been reinterred, has been repatriated and reinterred by the, the Tongva community. We don't have any, anything from Shumash, Tongva, Tatavium. They've all been reinterred. Thank you for speaking uh, and being here tonight, and thank you to the Hammer Museum as well. Um, I have a few questions. Um, one, in terms of your art, there's also, in addition to the representation of the red string, there is clay uh, or some type of dirt that has this orange hue to it. Can you speak to the significance of that? Sure. Um, so it's sometimes actually ochre, red ochre. Like in the installation, I used chunks of ochre, which is something that was used by the Tongva, um, often ground down and made uh, to pigment. It uses a, as a pigment for painting of the face um, or body. And I was looking at this. It was 
it's one of these ceremony materials that I don't always have access to. It's found in deposits in the soil. And sometimes we've worked on a site where they saved a bunch of it for us and they keep it. So when we need it for a ceremony, we can go get it. Um, but I don't often personally have access to it. And so I started using cinnamon as a way of looking at something that was very similar. It's visually similar. It's this kind of powdery substance. And playing with how, exchanging materials in a ceremony and how that affects them and does it. And um, it also had like this familial memory of, I always made this tea this with cinnamon sticks in my grandmother's kitchen. So the smell of it takes me back to this place. Um, and, you know, smell being connected to memory. And pretty much everybody has some memory of, I mean, we're joking about it being connected to pumpkin pie and Thanksgiving and native <laughs> things like when I was last time I was talking about this. But you know, you have this connection. There's a kind of a, it's a kind of American, a very American thing. You know, apple pies, pumpkin pie, and so it's really looking at um, ceremony in a way of allowing it to breathe and and live and 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 it allows me to keep doing these kind of ceremonies by using this other material. And so I, I do exchange it a lot. Sometimes I use actual um, ochre, and sometimes it's cinnamon um, in the but the installation has both, so. It's, you have to smell it to know. Yeah, exactly. Just don't put it in your mouth. It has paint <laughs> connected to it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. OK. Oh. Um, another question is in regards to the Tongva as, as a tribe and um, how things are moving forward now. Are there Tongva initiatives that are uh, being worked on collectively, um, where can we learn about that? Is that something that people can plug into? Um, um, Tongva initiatives. Tongva initiatives. Um, I, mean, I think there's a lot of forward movement in places. Like there's Tongva Alley downtown LA, Tongva Park. There's more visibility happening. Um, I know people are um, revitalizing the language and working to kind of have that be a spoken thing again. Um, there, there is on Facebook the Tongva word of the day. Yeah, it's... <laughs> with uh, that Pamela Monroe, who's a, a linguist, has been working with the community. Yeah. Um, so... It's yeah. how I did a lot of my titles for the show, you know? <laughs> like, I, I was learning the language to, yeah. to title the images. Is the language still being spoken? No, so it was not, mm -hmm. but... Yes, this linguist at Berkeley, right? She's worked with the, the group um, to actually create syntax and conjugations. And um, there are groups that get together on, on like, over Skype or, or FaceTime or whatever to practice speaking it. So it's, I, I wouldn't say it's a spoken and so well as a conversational thing, but in this, this word of the day thing, we'll, we'll go into phrases that are kind of every day along with things that we're more... Yeah, we actually, Pam and has been working with Virginia Carmelo and a lot of her family and ones who can make the language, um, they have language classes at yeah. least once a week. And so when they came to, to speak, they were actually speaking whole sentences yeah. and phrases. So there is more and more. Yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> when I look at some of your photographs, I think about plant geography, um, specifically the one with the white sage and there's mustard flowers in the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, and I th I'm sh pretty sure those were plants that came over with the Spaniards. The, the mustard, white sage? The mustard flower. Um, that. You know, I, I do use a lot of plant mat matter. I, those are all photos in this hillside. Right. I'm not 100% sure about the mustard. Um, I guess my question yeah. is, um, in terms of plant geography and how plants came to California, that a lot of them came over with colonialists, people who colonized the area. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, with that mix of plants in the landscape now, how that affects like how you look at this land that you're connected to by your ancestors, or if it's something you think about or not. Um, I mean, I, for me, those are something that kind of have a past memory of, the, like, the spring. People say there are no sp seasons in Los Angeles, but there are. You just have to be really <laughs> in tune to the, their subtlety. But, like, the spring in these hillsides, 
looks really different. And, and a lot of that is more memory-based of, of what I've included. I like to include native plants. I think that it's important to... But I think there was probably more here than we realize, you know? Um, so it, it, it goes in and out of kind of... It's, again, the cultural and the personal memories intertwining um, with each other. Uh, she asked if the exhibit was still up. Yes, the Made in LA exhibit is up until September 2nd. So. So do you, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I guess I'm a little confused about all the pictures that you've taken and you've made photographs. Mm -hmm. it, that's no longer there in on the mountainside anymore or is the, where you did all this? Um, some of it remains because it's um, like a family home held piece of property that, you know, some of that red yarn and the kind of things exist. It's not something that really anybody visits except for myself. Um, <laughs> I'll have dragged a few curators out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, it's really you know, this land that is private, and that's part of the issue, or the, the, what I'm talking about, it's private land, and so there is our access issues. Um, but yeah, they, some of them I do leave up, and I see how they change over time, and um, yeah, sometimes the images that come out are way, much later than my initial kind of working with the space. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for this conversation. It was really, really interesting and so great to hear Mercedes talk about your work. Um, first off, I have to say I work at the Natural History Museum and there's a really great video that we have right now where people are speaking Tongva language. There's like Barbara Drake, Julia, who's here in the audience, and Robert Dorme. I'm not, I'm forgetting all the names. Um, anyway, so the question I had was, um, I studied archeology span in undergrad and worked with some South American archeologists and was thinking a lot about institutions as you guys were talking, um, especially positions kind of within the institution and sort of Mercedes, your position is this, what was it called, like a cultural? Consultant. Cultural consultant and um, was really curious just in terms of, um, maybe Wendy, you could speak to this as working at the Fowler, um, but sort of the way that sometimes these positions uh, reproduce relationships like in the world, like the idea of like a native informant or um, looking to specific communities um, of the oppressed or people of color as holding all of this knowledge or being responsible for determining sort of what happens to these artifacts or objects. And so I guess I'm curious about um, whether those positions are something that you are thinking about in terms of not necessarily updating, but also questioning the ways that these positions get reproduced um, instead of kind of updated or thought through. So it's not necessarily like a critique, but maybe a question of whether or not um, there are new ways of thinking about how these positions get determined like in institutions. Um, I mean, I, since I'm not in the museum world, I'll speak anyway because I can just have an opinion in general. But um, I think, um, I mean, I, I did think some of what you were talking about, about being designated as like a native cultural monitor when your training isn't in that, you're being asked to speak from your position essentially as a native person and as a Tongvan person. I think some of those categories can be problematic. And there is, at least in my own experience in law and in the way consultation happens sometimes, particularly around development projects and other things, there can be a certain degree of um, 
uh, box checking in terms of consultation to make sure that you've met all the requirements where they're not really looking for deep substantive knowledge and or they're not looking to actually modify the project at all. They just need to be able to say that there was a native person there. Um, and that's a big part of what happens in at least in a lot of development projects in Indian country and on Indian lands. And so I think there are people who put, are pushing back against the categories in general, it, because it's not just about the category, it's the broader implication of what is the overall goal in making sure that the native voice is heard in that space. And sometimes it's really not um, about moving the needle on the project at all. It's just insulating either the government or the corporation against um, subsequent litigation um, for failing to include a native person in the project. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there was somewhat of a critique of the structure of it, and I think that's a legitimate critique, and I think there is more and more pushback against those kinds of categories. Um, I think we've reached nine o'clock. Did you want to close? Oh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, there is, there is more pushback, and um, the hard part is that you can't legislate intent. So you can do everything you want. I mean, there have been so many sort of like, oh, well, let's just redefine consultation. And let's just, you know, like try to make it sooner that people consult. But you can do those things. But if you're really not interested in hearing what the community has to say, or you've already made up your mind that you're going to say that it doesn't matter what's there, then there's nothing that you can do other than having being a federally recognized tribe with a good attorney that's willing to fight. And that's often where tribes are kind of pushed to, and that's not where they want to be. One, it just seems really awful. And, and two, it's a lot of money and a lot of time that they don't necessarily have and certainly is out of the reach for the Tongva community. So then they're relying on their cousins who are like Sam and Well or, or Pachanga that has those resources. And, and they do often step in, but it, it's not a great place to want to be in. So, um, but again, if you can have the best people who have the best intentions and lots of wonderful things come from it, or you can be someone who isn't interested at all and it doesn't matter what kind of legal you know, definitions there are, you're going to find a way not to do it. So, yeah. Um, well, oh, Michelle, I oh, had a question. Sorry. Oh, yes. We have time yeah. for one more question. For one more question. One more. <laughs> it's a good question because it ends with Mercedes. He started this all, I think. <laughs> I think it's a good question. Um, I was just wondering how you see your art fitting in with lar the larger art world of American Indian art and how you see it specifically in relation to a developing urban Indian art that's taken place across Canada and the U.S. and places like Minneapolis, Detroit, etc. Like how you see your art given voice to the urban Indian art, but also where do you see it in a larger spectrum of California Indian art? We talked about James Luna who recently passed, who, who, which is sad for us, um, but also, you know, in a larger spectrum of Amer uh, American Indian art in general. Yeah, um, I think, God, that's a, a kind of big question. I feel like there's a good momentum right now in that people are interested and in, in talking again, and I feel that not growing up on the reservation on a reservation, not having that experience. When I was younger, it made me feel very insecure, you know, because I didn't have that same context. And I, and I, I had a different experience growing up. I grew up in Los Angeles. I didn't leave here until my mid-20s. Um, and I would sometimes maybe be in grad school. and. I, at one point I was doing video work, which I don't normally take photos of myself, but pe people would be like, well, maybe if you just looked a little more native or wore more jewelry or something, <laughs> you know? like Because we definitely have a con this kind of cultural concept about what native people look like. And it, the ironic thing is a lot of that was informed by Hollywood, which is a L.A. thing, you know? So it's it's kind of a weird place to be in. but. I'm very careful to make work that feels like it's of this place, you know? I, I don't want to make work that's really decodable or not authentic to my experience. Um, and, you know, I went to grad school with another um, Native guy who grew up 
um, in the reservation in Arizona, and our work our work looked really different. And his would have probably been described as more um, visually native, you know, like people would recognize that. Um, but for me, I really want the work to spark curiosity. I want it to. I don't want someone to be able to walk up to it and say like, "Oh, I get that. I know exactly what that is." <laughs> done and walk out of the room you know like I want people to be like what the? you know like I don't decode all the signs and the symbols very intentionally because I want people to maybe have that same feeling that I have looking at things sometimes where I don't know and you know that's a hard place it's hard to admit that we don't know it all right you know and and um, I want people to maybe want to learn more from looking at my work um, and then in the, in the broader art world I mean, I never know where I fit, you know? I just keep making work, and I feel sometimes a camaraderie with another artist. Um, I love Gabrielle Roscoe, like, just, but usually it's in, in, the, in the kind of the poetic space that you kind of, you need to, it's not narrative, you know? I, I, I feel like you need to kind of, piece things together along with me, like you do when you're reading poetry, back to my undergrad degree in literature, you know, which in informed me a lot. Um, so I have always kind of worked in that vein, but I don't know, hopefully that answers something. <laughs> All right, I think we're really out of time, but thank you to all <laughs> yes, of you. Thank, thank you, you so to the much. Hammer. Thank you. Thank you especially to Mercedes you. Yo, um, you and, to the, and to the Tonga people yeah. <laughs> for having us here. Right. Miigwech. Good night.